title of our message this morning is The Danger of Misplaced Worship. The Danger of Misplaced Worship. Last week, we started into this text here in Acts uh, 14, as we've been following the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, and they reached a new location, the city of Lystra, and we we just kind of camped out in those first few verses. We saw an incredible miracle of healing that took place as Paul was preaching, and, and so we we got to see those things, but we, we didn't really get into the whole narrative and everything that, that took place in Lystra. So we're going to come back to that today. And I want us to pick back up in verse 8 and, and kind of move beyond this, this idea as we thought of last week of God who has the power to heal and does bring great healing, but doesn't always do that. How do we, how do we reconcile that? How do we work through that? And so this morning, let's see what else takes place in this city, re- resuming in verse 8 to give us our context. Now, at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. When the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Laodicean, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. Like we've often noted when we come to passages like this, and there's, there's many of them in the book of Acts where we see God doing miraculous things, wonderful signs and, and miracles, healing people like this. As he does here through Paul, healing this guy who's never walked before in his life, the public response to seeing those things is really the same kind of response we would have seeing something like that today, right? It's amazement and wonder and a desire to worship, which is the right response when we see the power of God come out in such miraculous ways. But that desire here in in Lystra was focused upon the wrong object. The people wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas instead of the God who was working through them, right? So what the people did here was that this was the natural response for them because they were operating out of their default worldview, the way they had been raised, the way they had been taught, and they, they thought this is how the world operates. This is just kind of how they, they were naturally responding to what they had seen. Since they were raised in a Greek-influenced culture, when they saw a powerful sign, a miracle, something like that, they thought it must be because one of the gods have come down from Mount Olympus to visit us. Right? They believed in the Greek pantheon or the Roman pantheon of gods. And if you've ever read Greek or Roman mythology, you know th- this is a pretty common theme of some of those stories, right? The, the, the gods showing up and doing something on earth, even taking the form of a man or an animal or something like that. You know, one of the um, ironic things uh, to me about my childhood and the way I was raised is that my, my parents, from my mother mostly, was really, really adamant when I was young that I was not allowed to read the Harry Potter books as those were coming out. They were getting really, really popular, right? Everybody was reading them back then, but I, I wasn't allowed to. And that really wasn't so much a radical position at that time, um, the, the books were very controversial when they, they first released, if you remember all that, in Christian circles. In fact, pretty much every really serious Christian family I knew growing up, they, they didn't read Harry Potter. That was, they were against it. You know, Focus on the Family back at that point had come out very strongly against the, the Harry Potter series. Dr. Dobson said that, that he thought the books were very dangerous because they romanticized and positively portrayed the occult and witchcraft. So he, he advised against it, and, and some of you up here didn't seem to get that memo, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, it was actually funny because when I went to CBC, again, I, I was raised like that. Malia was raised like that. We go to CBC, and I remember there was, uh, it was quite the scandal. There were students who wanted to go see the Harry Potter movies as they were coming out. And some of them went to watch them at like a midnight release, which meant they were going to miss curfew. They were going to break curfew, right? And so there was a huge uproar on campus because we had a, we had a 1, in, 1 p.m. curfew. You had to be in your, in your dorms. The dorms were locked. And there was this big uproar about it because not only were they going to watch Harry Potter, which was already, you know, but they were breaking curfew because that's what Harry Potter does. It causes you to break all the rules, and you know. And so, 
looking back is quite funny to me. There was such a, such a, a strong feeling towards that, that one thing. And I'm not hating on Harry Potter now. Malia's actually reading the books currently. But the irony of this whole thing was I was prevented from reading that one series of books, but not anything else in our library. And, and this, is, this is a weird but true fact about me. I read literally every single book in our elementary library, all of them, except Harry Potter. And because I wasn't allowed to read that, so when I finished, I finished literally every book the library owned, I had to go before the school board on a special or in a regular business meeting and get permission to be given permission to go to the middle school to check out books now because I had literally read everything in there. It's also why I have a reversed C curve in my neck because I sit like this all the time and I read too much. You're learning all about me. Anyway, the irony of it was I was not allowed to read Harry Potter because of what that may teach me. But I could read anything else that was in the library. And one of the things that was in our library was collections of Greek and Roman mythologies. And we're talking about the collections of stories like they use in lit classes, not like you know, Percy Jackson and then kind of the, the child versions. We're talking like an anthrology of the Greek and Roman mythologies. They're not kid-friendly at all. I don't know why they were in the elementary library, but they were there. And so I read a lot of Greek and Roman mythology as an elementary age student. And, and one of the things you, you find so often is that these gods, as they, they viewed them in Greek and Roman mythology, they were really just more powerful beings, right? But they were very much like human people. They didn't have a view of a transcendent God who was utterly good and holy and powerful and, and merciful. They had this idea of the gods being kind of like us, but they, they just had more powerful. So these gods got jealous and they had fights and, and they, they warred with each other and they were mischievous. And sometimes they just, they just did things because, you know, to, to other people, human people, because they thought it would be funny, right? And so when you read these stories, you, you, you see when a god came down from Mount Olympus, that not, wasn't necessarily a good thing for the people. And in fact, in Lystra, there was a legend that at one point, two of the gods had come from Mount Olympus and visited the city of Lystra in ancient times. And because the majority of the people weren't uh, hospitable to them, only one old couple had offered them hospitality and brought them into their home, that the gods destroyed Lystra, the whole region in times past, and only that one couple survived, and from them the whole city was was rebuilt and, and populated. So there's this this um, this history here of uh, what they believe has already taken place in their region, and there's this view of these gods that they that they worship, and so these people, when Paul and Barnabas come to them and do a mighty sign and wonder and this miraculous thing, they think. It must be the gods visiting us again. And so they associate Barnabas with Zeus and Paul with Hermes because he was the, the chief speaker. He was the one preaching the most. And so their response is, hey, hey, we've already been down this path once, right? Last time when the gods showed up, we didn't do the right thing. And so they destroyed the whole city. We're not making that mistake again. So they decide we will worship Paul and Barnabas will bring an ox or a bull, we'll, we'll kill it, and we will worship them. That way they won't become angry with us and destroy us. Now, think for a moment about the apostles, right? We've been tracking this missionary journey, and we know they've already traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles. They faced all kinds of danger, all kinds of hardships, all kinds of opposition and threats, even threats against their life, right? And all of this has been very, very difficult, and these people here in Lystra, they want to receive them with great honor. They want to sacrifice a bull. They want to esteem and worship them. They want to give them the best accommodations in town, the best food, the best drinks, any comfort that they would ask for. They wouldn't, they wouldn't say no, right? The apostles could have anything they want at this moment. There are some real benefits to be gained from this situation because they would be popular. They would have all the approval imaginable. And yet, that's, that's a really dangerous thing for us human beings. Not many of us are likely to, to receive worship and sacrifices to us <laughs> in this culture. But being well approved of, being popular, having influence over the people, getting comfort from, from others, those are things that we still want today and things that we often pursue today, right? Right? But there's a real danger in us pursuing those things. To be popular today, like it would have meant for Paul and Barnabas here in this situation, often means compromising the truth. 
It would mean understanding, hey, the crowds want to do this thing. This is what's popular. This is what the people want. Let's just give them what they want. Let's let them enjoy the things that they are trying to do. I mean, when you offer a sacrifice and have a festival, everyone's happy. Everyone's celebrating. Let's just, let's just let them do that. Let's try to please the crowd, right? Paul and Barnabas knew to let that happen, though, would mean to compromise on the truth. And they were unwilling to do it. For us, it, it, it probably doesn't look like a sacrifice in our name being offered, but, but it might look like not standing up for what God says in some other way, right? That, that may be compromising how we think or talk about LGBTQIA plus issues. It may be how we interact with, with those who are engaged in homosexual lifestyles. It may be that we're going to be not so vocally, publicly committed to opposing the murder of babies and abortion because, you know, that's, that there's some people who are really passionate about that. We don't want to offend people. It may be just compromising in smaller ways during the week, right? Not reading our Bibles, not praying so that we can spend our time doing other things. Not following God's ways when we're around friends or coworkers. So, so they won't see us as odd. I mean, no one wants to be seen as odd, right? But if you're always talking about Jesus, if you're always, you know, that one friend who's like, you know, no, we really shouldn't go and do that. That's, that's a difficult situation to be in. And you're not going to be very popular if you're, if you're the guy who's saying, no, I'm, I'm not going to drink and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, you know, that kind of stuff. So some of us, we just compromise. You know, we tell little lies. We cheat on small stuff. We let little, little moral issues go. Why? Because we want to be approved of. We want to be popular. We want to be liked. We're all tempted towards those type of things to try and gain acceptance and approval from other people around us. It's not a new temptation. It's been around in humanity for a long time. It was right here in Acts 14 too, I think, for Paul and Barnabas. But let's look at how they responded. Look at verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Yet even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. The response of the apostles, which, which takes a few minutes because you remember it said they were crying out in Laodicean. So they're, they're getting really excited and worked up in another language that Paul and Barnabas don't know. So once they get over the language barrier and understand what's happening, right? they see a bull coming in and the garland, like, oh, they're going to they're gonna worship and sacrifice. And they keep saying, Zeus, Zeus, oh, okay. They figured it out. What they immediately do is not, I mean, what do you think, Barnabas? Can we... You know, maybe maybe we correct them after we get some of the some of the meat, you know, from the sacrifice. Maybe 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 tomorrow we get with it. No, immediately it says they rejected the worship. They knew it would cost them their popularity, the approval of the crowds, and they went to immediately trying to explain the truth. And the sermon I think is very interesting here. Paul realizes these people can't really fully grasp the fullness of the gospel yet. And, and so he begins to go back all the way to the start of biblical revelation and start with the foundational truth. There is one God. And this one God, the God of the Bible, is very different than the many gods you worship out of the Greek pantheon. Paul tells the people there's one true God, the living creator of all things, not many gods, not a whole bunch of gods over different parts of the, the nature who control different things like they believe from their pagan upbringing. And this God, he wants to explain to them, is not cruel. He's not a God who fights with other gods, whose war and conflicts creates issues for humanity. No, this God, Paul tells them as his second point, is merciful and forbearing. He is patient and kind. It's very different than the Greek and Roman gods that these people believed in. Those gods didn't care about humans, really, at all. To, to get them to be kind or do good things to you, you basically had to bribe them with offerings or build great temples, right? So that they would respond. No, and, and, and Paul says, no, that's not the way the real God is. He, that, that's the God that, that has been created in your imaginations, in your mythologies, but the real, true, living God, he is merciful, he's patient, he's loving towards you 
by just who he is. You don't need to bribe him. You don't need to earn it somehow. That's a radical thing that Paul is trying to explain to these people. And Paul says that it's the one God who's responsible for providing everything that his creatures need. Again, this is against what they believe. They believe there's a God who controls the sun. There's a God who controls the rain. A God who controls fertility. He, there's all these different gods you need to go up, get to bless you in these different ways. And he says, no, there's one God who takes care of all your needs. The one true God who created all things, he sends the rain. He causes things to grow. He gives you the harvests that you will reap. He will bless you with foods. He is even the God who gives you comfort and enjoyable things in this life. It all comes from this one true God that Paul is proclaiming to them. And so to hear that this is what God is like would have been incredible to these people. Because these truths about God really are good news, right? Not just for pagans to hear, but also for us to hear in our modern day too. We need to remind ourselves and share with others these things about God because they help us combat the temptation towards idolatry even today. We're not typically tempted, none of us in this room at least, towards worshiping Zeus or, or Hermes in particular, but we're tempted to worship other things. We're tempted to worship the government, political leaders, businesses and organizations, we're tempted to worship ourselves every single day as if we have some control. Our needs are not really all that different than these people in Lystra were, right? We, we need food. We want comforts and pleasures. We long for joy and gladness. And, and, and so when someone or something promises us those things, we respond with attention. We respond really with worship. When a government or a leader or a company promises us they'll give us something that we want, something that we need, well, then we begin to put our trust and our focus on them instead of on God. And we worship those things by giving them more of our time, more of our energies, more of our concern, more of our care than, the, than what we devote to the one true living God. And that's the heart of idolatry, really. It doesn't look like bulls being sacrificed. It doesn't look like idols being carved all the time. It looks like our hearts being focused on something, someone else, other than the one true God. That's the heart of idolatry. And so we need to combat that by rightly remembering, by, by, by preaching it to ourselves, not just hearing it preached to you once a week from here, but, but throughout the week, reminding yourself and your heart who God really is and what God really does. When you're hungry, you don't need to rely on your own ability to go get things for yourself or the stores to stock your favorite foods. You need to pray to the God who provides food. When, when we're in harvest season here, we don't need to rely on, well, we've got good combines and, and we've put in hard work and we've, we've measured the, the content of the moisture. And so we, we, you know, we've got it figured out. We need to trust in the God who provides for us to go and, and reap the harvest, right? There, when we orient ourselves around thinking about God more and the, the other things less, we begin to worship rightly instead of fall into the traps of idolatry. Now, this sermon, though it is pretty truncated, and Paul here doesn't, doesn't really get to the gospel at this moment. I think Paul uses this same type of method when he gets to Athens, which, which we'll, we'll talk about later as we go farther into the book of Acts. There, he kind of lays out the same start, and then he, he shifts it into a gospel presentation. But here, he doesn't quite get to that point. And I think the, the reason is because the crowd was so worked up. You know, they were, I mean, they were ready to, to kill the bull and offer the sacrifice, and Paul's got to kind of talk them down from that. And he gets them talked down, but it's still a pretty precarious situation here in Lystra, as we, we see in the next verse. Look at 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, there's some debate here whether this is like immediately after this speech and the crowds kind of calm down. And then, then there's these Jews among them and they're kind of talking them all up and, and, and it immediately turns into a mob. Or this is a few days later. And you, you'll find commentaries that kind of debate both sides of that. Personally, I, I think this is probably a few days later. I think he got the crowds calmed down with that speech. He got them sent away and then he spent a few more days kind of ministering and teaching and making some disciples because the text will mention later that there are some disciples, some converts there. So I, I think this is likely just a few days later, but regardless what has taken place here is that there are Jewish people who so hate Paul and Barnabas and the message of Jesus Christ 
that they had run them out of those other cities, right? They'd run them out of Antioch, uh, Poseidon Antioch, and, and Iconium. And not, they weren't just content to say, hey, get out of our town, get out of our lives. Out of, like, these guys hated them so much that they traveled down. They followed them all the way to Lystra in order to cause more trouble for them. And, and Antioch, Poseidon Antioch, is 100 miles from Lystra. You're talking about some dedication, right, to walk 100 miles because you hate a guy that much, right? <laughs> but that's what they do, and they, they certainly cause some trouble. How exactly they persuaded the crowds, we don't know what they said. I think likely it had to do with, with trying to get them to see, hey, these guys here, they're, they're contradicting your worldview, your beliefs. You know, they're, they're insulting you by refusing to receive the worship that you offer. They're, they're telling these people, hey, hey, these guys, these, this is Paul and Barnabas, they're mean people. They're insulting. They're arrogant. They're hateful. They're disrespectful of you and your, your customs. I think they used things like that to, to stir up a mob because that's what we see today, stirring up mobs, right, in our own society. And when mobs get stirred up and people get really riled, they, they turn violent fairly quickly. That's not just an ancient phenomenon. That's, that's today too, right? Look at, look at our own nation. Look at the violence and the destruction of mobs in cities all across America. It doesn't, it doesn't take much to do that because of how broken and how depraved humanity is today as it was in, in Lystra. And so Paul here, he's, as, as was noted, he's the, the chief speaker. He's the one preaching. Maybe on this particular day, it's just him that's out there preaching and Barnabas is off doing something else. We're not really sure. But regardless, the, the crowd, the mob gets focused in on Paul and they decide to stone him. They pick up stones. They th- they're throwing them at him. And he, 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 he's being beaten so badly by these stones that he's, he's bloody and bruised and barely breathing. And they intended to kill him with this. This wasn't just like, you know, throwing some rocks. Hey, get out of here. Get out of here. You know, this was like, we will kill you. And that's what they, they thought they had done. Like, he, he looked so bad. He wasn't breathing. He's laying there, a bloody mess that they grab him, and they just drag him out of the city. And, and, and they're so filled with hate that, that they're not even going to bury him. They're, they're just, you know, drag him out of the city, throw him in a ditch, right? Let the wild animals eat him. But you remember how we said that the apostles, they were so committed to this mission that they were given by God that they were willing to give their lives for the gospel. Clearly, I think that's true because here, that's how far it went. Paul did not recant when they started throwing stones at him. He didn't agree, hey guys, all right, I get it, I get it, I'll shut up, just, just don't throw any more stones. He didn't beg them and tell them, no guys, it's a misunderstanding. I mean, I, mean, I, I follow one God, but you follow your God. That's a, you know, we're, we're good, we're good. I just, you know, he, he didn't do any of that. He suffered being stoned by a mob, trying to be killed for the sake of Jesus. I think Paul had to have been thinking in that moment about Stephen and how he stood there and watched Stephen pay the ultimate price, be stoned to death. And Paul, at that point, before he had met the living Christ, he approved of that. You remember? I mean, I wonder if as, as, as Paul's being stoned, did he pray what Stephen prayed? Lord, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. And Paul must have known it could come to this. You remember the prophet in Damascus when, when Paul was converted was told that Paul was going to suffer for God's name's sake. Paul knew that going in. And he was so committed to the call that he stayed the course, kept the faith, held fast to the message, didn't waver in his belief or commitment to the mission. He was ready to give his life for the sake of Jesus. And it looked like he really did there in verse 19. But we read in verse 20. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered into the city, and on the next day he went with Barnabas to Derbe. (laughs) I I just, you know, Paul's one of my, my, my favorite characters in the Bible, and I love this about him because here he is, a guy who's been stoned to the point that the mob, the group, thinks he's dead, Right? And I don't think he actually died and was, was resurrected here. Some commentators will, will assume that's the case. I don't think that's the case because I think Luke would have made a bigger deal of that if, if he had actually died and then, and then been risen. And I don't think the language requires that. I think he just, he was very close to, to death. He was barely breathing. He was bloody. He was bruised. And yet God does miraculously give him the strength as these disciples come around him to stand up. And then Paul says, let's go back in the city. <laughs> 
And that's what he does. He goes, he goes back into the very place where the mob just tried to, to kill him, stays a whole nother night before going on to Derby with Barnabas. I mean, this is Paul's radical commitment to the gospel on display, right? He goes forward from here. And, and notice that he goes forward to Derby. He travels 60 more miles to the south and to the east to go preach in another city after having been stoned nearly to death here in Lystra. I don't think any of us would have blamed him if he would have said, okay, barely made it out alive. God preserved me. Barnabas, let's wrap this up, you know? <laughs> let's just beeline south to the coast. We'll get a ship. We'll head back to Antioch in Syria. We've earned some, some furlough, right? But that wasn't Paul. A guy who was almost dead goes back into the very city that tried to kill him, and the next morning gets up and says, all right, Barnabas, we need to get to Derby, 60 miles. Take us a week to walk there. Let's go. That's what they did. That's pretty incredible. I mean, how many of us need to pray for that kind of resolve in our life? I mean, maybe just like a part of that, right? <laughs> because some of us, we can't handle when, when someone says something bad about us or says a mean thing to us. I mean, some of, for some of us, that's all it takes to get us to shut up and not go any further with the mission that God has given to us. A little bit of conflict, verbal conflict, and we're like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> Man, and Paul here, he, he nearly gives his whole life for the sake of the gospel, and then he says, you know what? It's got to go forward, so no matter the cost, no matter the opposition, here we go, on to Derby. Man, if we had that kind of commitment, that kind of resolve that Paul had, imagine what we would see happen in the world today. I mean, because we know what, we, what happened in the world through Paul, right? So, so it's, not, it's not a stretch to say God would do incredible and amazing things if we, like Paul, were being faithful instruments for God to use. So as the worship team comes um, to lead us in our final song today, I, I just want to point out one other key thing from this text, and I want us to, to, to use that to set our eyes upon who Jesus really is. You remember when Paul and Barnabas are there, and the people come to worship him, the, the first thing they say to them is, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you. They're saying, hey, hey we're, just, we're just created people, just like you are. We don't deserve worship. We're not, we're not gods come down from Mount Olympus or anywhere else. Peter had said the same thing when he went to Cornelius' house. Remember that? Cornelius wanted to, to worship Peter, and he says, no, stand up, stand up. No, I, I, you do not worship me. The apostles were quick to reject worship because they knew it was misplaced. In Revelation 22, at the very end of the book, after all the incredible things that John was shown, we read this. It's actually in Revelation 19 as well. It occurs in both places. But in 22, 8 to 9, we read, I, John, am the one who have heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that, for I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and all those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. So not only do the apostles, these human messengers, refuse to be worshipped, but even angels refuse to be worshipped. They say, look, we're just creatures too. We're just servants of God. The only one who deserves worship, it's God himself. But we've often noted this as we've talked about the text of Scripture, particularly in the gospel accounts. The response of Jesus when people begin to worship him is very different. I just want to give you three verses to think about this morning. Matthew 14, 33. This is when Jesus has calmed the storm with his disciples on, on the lake, right? And he enters the boat, and, and Matthew 14, 33 says, And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And Jesus, there in that text, he receives that worship. He doesn't correct them. He doesn't refute them. He doesn't say, No, 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 I'm just a, a, a creature like you, my brothers. No, he receives worship as God. When he appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, he, he shows Thomas, the one who doubted, right? Proof that he really was the one who had risen. And Thomas's reply in John 28, 20, 28 is, Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus receives that worship. He doesn't refute him. He doesn't correct him. 
And on the mountainside, right before the ascension, when the disciples came together, Matthew 28, 17 says, when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. And though some doubted, and he speaks to that, but, but this worship of Jesus is always received by him. He never refuses it. He never corrects it. He never says, no, 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 I'm merely, I'm merely a good prophet, merely a, a teacher. No, he, he receives that worship because he himself is God who has come in the flesh. And so while nobody else and nothing else is worthy of worship, no other person, no angels, no governments, no organizations, just Jesus, today I want us to respond to that reality of who he is. We're, we're going to pray, and, and maybe we're going to pray, Lord, you know, help me be bold like Paul was bold. Help me, help me to be that committed, that radically sold out to the gospel. Maybe we need to pray that, but, but today the object of our worship is not Paul, it's not anyone else, it's not anything else, it's Jesus. So let's lift our eyes to him and let's worship him together in this place. Would you stand with us? The altars are open. If you want to come and pray, you're welcome to. But let's just take a few minutes to put our eyes upon Jesus and worship him together in this place.